Welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner. And I am Tony Schmidt. And today, Tony, we're going to have a very special episode. I mean, not that special, but it's, it's we've done a variety no. of different episodes. Don't tell yourself short. It's that special. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Some episodes we do are kind of current events. Like Greece was kind of a current event episode. Yes. And other episodes have been very specialized. You know, the Colby episode was an interview with uh, a particular guest. Episodes. Yes. And when we analyzed the B-movie, that was a very specific piece of culture that we were analyzing. But we've also done other episodes that are timeless in a certain way, and what I would put in the realm of Marxist classics. My favorite example of this is the episode that you mainly led about commodity fetishism. Hmm. Yes, that was a good one. Yeah, I really enjoyed what you put together for that one. Thanks. The episode that we're going to do today is on ideology. And this is a funny one because we kind of talk about ideology all the time. Yeah. And in fact, we even sort of talked about ideology in a roundabout way with the B-movie episode as well. Yeah, yeah. I was specifically thinking of that one. That was a particular analysis of ideology via one particular example. And it just comes up all the time with what we talk about. So I thought it'd be good for us to just talk about what does ideology mean from a Marxist perspective? Like, what do Marxists mean when we say ideology. And I think I want to start actually with, with Marx's approach to, uh, to his analysis, where he took something and assumed that the, the appearance of that thing was not necessarily the truth of that thing. Now that's, it's, ties in with with commodity fetishism like you mentioned earlier. So for example, the appearance of capitalism is that we are all free to make whatever choices we want. That I can work for this employer and if I don't like it I can quit and work for a different employer. That's my freedom and and the employer has the same freedom to hire me or someone else, and if they don't like whoever's working for them, to fire them and hire another person. Like, it only works if both people consent. It's a mutual consent kind of construct. And that's the image put forth by capitalism. And what Marx is saying is, that is the appearance of it, and Marx doesn't even really say that the appearance is wrong. He says that that's true. That, that that the thing that appears to be true is in fact true, but there is a deeper truth there as well. You know, what what you might call the essence. Yeah. And the the essence is is exploitation. So when it comes to capitalism, it's the fact that even though you both agree, you and your employer, to whatever wage you receive, if capitalism is going to work, that wage is necessarily less than the value you create at that job. And and that's exploitation. But it's kind of hidden. You know, you don't really see it. It looks like it's not there because you both agreed to that number. But the only way the system can function is if the value you create is greater than the value you are paid. Yeah. And everybody understands that on an intrinsic basis. Like... If you said to somebody, well, you know, you make in one hour $25 worth of goods, therefore I'm going to pay you $30 an hour, people would go, well, that seems weird. Or, like, obviously, you're, you know, people, I think every worker understands that without having to, you know, be told it, but 
nobody thinks of it as odd or weird. It's it's something that's there, but it's not in the forefront of our thought. And I'm not entirely sure that it's something that people think about regularly. No, I don't think so either. But I think if you presented them with the, would, do you make more value or less value than you were paid, everyone would say less. See, I've had this experiment oh, yeah? where, where I have asked friends, non-Marxists, uh, the, the very interesting question, how do you know how much your labor is worth? Ooh. Because there, I mean, there's lots of ways that the people answer. So, you know, some people will just talk about, you know, the kind of the use value of their labor is, mm -hmm. is where they go or, you know, about how much they care, how good of a job they do or whatever. It's very interesting when I tell them that there are kind of two ways to think about it. You could say that the value of your labor is equal to whatever you are paid. Because if it was worth more, then you could go and find someone else to hire you for more. You know, that's, that's the standard capitalist argument for what is the value. The value of anything is the value that you pay for it. Yeah. And then I also present the Marxist argument that, well, it doesn't make any sense for the employer to hire you unless you create more value for that employer than the value that you receive in wages. And they also usually agree with that. It's this very interesting contradiction. And, and of course, Marx uh, addresses that contradiction by saying the, the amount that you're paid is the amount to reproduce the worker, to create a worker at a certain standard of living that is, is customary to that time and place. And the value you create is independent from that. It's the labor power versus labor value distinction or, or labor versus labor value. I forget the technical terms. I don't get into them that often, but you, you know what I mean. Yeah. It's the distinction between how much you have to be paid for you to show up the next day and, and to like raise a family of, of similar education level and blah, blah, blah. And also, and that's one value, and the, and then the other value is the the value you create for the employer, which necessarily needs to be more than that, or or that employer will not be an employer for very long. Yeah, it's the it's the same argument that I saw made really poorly about um, why minimum wage is bad, because um, there was a dumb argument about minimum wage is bad because it hurts the worker. Because their argument was that people are so unproductive, low-wage workers are so unproductive, that they do not even produce the value of the minimum wage. Therefore, by forcing them to hire people at that, they would hire less people. I'm like, okay, even if you accept that, that's true no matter what. They won't hire more people than the value that they create. So whether or not there's a minimum wage doesn't really do that. It's just... It's just the way it works. You're pretending like it's special with a minimum wage as opposed to, like, the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I wanted to pull in is how commodity fetishism fits really well as an example of this Marxist frame, frame of thinking about things. Uh, well, And we'll just recap it quickly for commodity fetishism because we have a whole episode on it. But uh, I, th I think it is important to recap because... Out of all Marxist concepts, I feel like commodity fetishism is perhaps the most often misinterpreted. Uh, it's not a love for commodities. That's sometimes what, what, uh, people will explain it as, or, or like a, a weird, bizarre, over, um, involvement with material things. Right. Instead, commodity fetishism is the perception that a product is just there, that it has no history, that it's just a product on a shelf, and, and the only thing that you need to know about that product is the price that is there for you to pay. Where, in reality, that product is a part of human social production, that a bunch of humans got together and made that thing, and what the price actually is, is just a way of boiling down what the relations are between you, the owner of your, uh, the owner of the means of production where you work, the owner of the means of production where th that worker works, and the value of the work that they've done. It's 
the way that all of the people of society have divided up their labor and then divide up the goods produced by that labor. Yeah, and how it gets hidden. And a great quick example of that is Costco is being sued in California because their prawns are being produced by slave labor. Wow. But you don't know that when you go to Costco and buy some prawns. You see prawns with a value, a price, and that's the end of it. Yep. It's All it is is a good price. Yep. Rather than a human social relation. Yeah. A terrible human social relation in that case. Yeah. Anti-social relation. Yeah. That would be a good name for a punk band. Ooh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I'll work on the guitar a little bit better. All right. (laughs) Uh, But... Again, it's it's that same framework uh, of Marx where it appears as one thing, and that thing is true. The appearance is, in fact, true, that it is a commodity on a shelf with a price. However, the, the Marxist approach to this is that there is a deeper truth there. And in many ways, this is Marx's answer to what is the point of science. That the point of science is to take a world that appears one way and actually show what the underlying truth is. To take a non-Marxist example, but one that underlines the point, you could say that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's the appearance. But in reality, we know that it's the rotation of the earth that causes the the, the appearance that the sun is rising and setting. Yeah. So if the point of science is to demystify the world... What what really all of Marx's approach is to do science to demystify the realm of social science, of the science of how societies work and what they do. And so you could make the argument that all, all of what Marx is doing is to dispel ideology, because that's really the other force, right? If If science is what... Uh, will show the essence of something. Ideology is is the opposite force. It is the thing that reinforces the appearance. Like, why is it that that is the appearance in the beginning? It's because that's that's the ideology that culture has created. Yeah. Why do we have? Ca- why did communism fail? Because there is no system that works other than capitalism. There is no alternative, as Margaret Thatcher said. That's ideology for you. Yeah. That's why Soviet Union failed, and that's why, yeah. I, I feel like ideology comes with a connotation. Like, when people hear the word ideology, they think something very extreme. Mm-hmm. In in the sense of, you think of propaganda, you think of maybe Nazis, you think of brainwashing. But when we as Marxists use the word ideology, it's is something not necessarily so extreme. You know, the, what, what you gave was a good example of, of the more extreme end, yeah. the saying when Margaret Thatcher said, there is no alternative to capitalism, it is the only system. That's a very clearly ideological message. However, um, well, l- l- let me maybe explain it also this way, because this is a structure that... Uh, is fa- fairly commonly brought up in Marxist circles as well. And this is the base superstructure diagram. So I, I know visuals play really well on audio <laughs> podcasts, but bear with me because it's a fairly simple diagram. I think we can do the the word picture on this. The diagram is a triangle with a point at the top and a long flat part at the bottom. And the triangle is broken into two pieces. So, that you know, you could... It's the, you know, a trapezoid on the bottom and a triangle on top, essentially. And the bottom section marks labels as the means of production and the mode of production. So in other words, all of the tools, all of the factories, all of the raw materials, that's the means of production. And also the relations of production. In our case, capitalism, but in other societies, it's been feudalism or slavery or whatever. That is the bottom, the base of society. And and he puts it on the base because he believes that that is the strongest determining factor in what creates society. If you were to ask the question, why do we have the society we have? 
Marx would answer, the main and most important reason is the, the, the tools, the machinery, the technology that we use, and the different ways we divide that up, the ways that we structure the actual productive process. That is the main determinant in what kind of society we have. However, it's not the only thing about society. Society is not just how do we, you know, grow the crops and how do we build the house and how do we, you know, program the software. There is also that top layer, the triangle at the very top. And in that lies uh, what what's labeled on the diagram often as the superstructure, which is the government, uh, different politics, laws, culture, art and entertainment, education, religion, family structure, all of those things fall into that top superstructure. And you could really divide that superstructure into two pieces as well. And, and this is where we're going to bring in a little bit of Althusser. Uh, Louis Althusser was a French Marxist who, I think he did most of his work in the 60s, is that right? 60s and 70s, yeah. 60s and 70s. He was very much fascinated by the topic of ideology. And he broke it down in, into two pieces. He, he referred to the repressive state apparatus, which is not necessarily particularly ideological. And then the ideological state apparatus, which is strongly ideological. And the, but, but I would, I would argue, I would put both of these in, in the triangle of the superstructure. Yeah. So the repressive state apparatus is all of the things about the state that use physical force to reinforce the system. And this is a lot of what we talked about in our state and revolution episodes. If you're interested about repressive state apparatuses, listen to our state and revolution episode uh, from last season. These include the police, the army, things that are brought in that use physical force to stop any challenge to the system. And, and if you're not sure what a challenge to the system is, a very simple one would be uh, you've created something at your place of employment. You decide to take the products of your work home. That's not allowed on cap based on capitalism. You do not take the products of your labor home when you're an employee. You send render those to the employer for your wage, even though the value of those things is greater than your wage. You surrender that, and that's how capitalism works. And if you were to take home the product of your labor, you would be challenging that arrangement. You, you would be posing a challenge to the capitalist system. And so, you know, police would be called or you'd be hauled into court or whatever. There's a whole uh, repressive state apparatus, to use Althusser's term, to prevent that challenge from the system, to keep those under wraps. Yeah, or... The whole Cold War well, as well is a good example of that. One country like Vietnam wanted to do away with capitalism. The forces of capitalism sent the army to try and prevent that. Yeah. Uh, in our own history in this country, the certain strikes have been broken by the police or the National Guard or the army. So certain the, they've been used domestically as well. Yeah. Uh, and these are all good examples of challenges to capitalism. So the, it's not like this is a conspiracy theory. In fact, the, the, the capitalist system will use force to, to ensure that it, it remains dominant, that challenges to it are not allowed to maintain and grow and things like that. And if you don't believe it, try the earlier example of bringing home the things you make from work and you will see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but don't really do that. We don't actually want any of you to get in trouble. Yeah. But it would... Yeah. It would prove it. Yeah. yeah. If you, re it, if you we, really need proof, <laughs> do we, that. Otherwise... We enjoy having listeners who are not in jail. If anyone is listening in jail, I guess that's cool, too. That's great. Actually, that's really good if you're in jail and listening. Are you allowed to listen to podcasts in jail? <sighs> Probably, Probably not. not. Jail's... Yeah. Probably not. We they have like libraries, but that's probably it. Yeah, we should do. We should. We'll have to do an episode on that specific 
repressive state apparatus. Yeah. Or actually, is that even a repressive state apparatus? Jail might be... I suppose it does fit in, because it's the apparatus, it's the part of capitalism that deals with the people that they can't, for whatever reason, get to work within their system. Mm -hmm. It's the last resort other than killing people, Yep. which jail also sometimes does. Yeah. It's what you do with people who can't be made to work in the system. So in addition to repressive state apparatuses, Althusser comes up with this term to call that which he calls ideological state apparatuses, uh, which function through just ideas and the spread of certain ideas in culture, in sport, in education, in politics, in all of those things that we mentioned in the superstructure that are basically within the realm of ideas that don't mainly use force, but mainly use ideas. Uh, and I should point out, and I think this is maybe what you were hesitating on when you mentioned prisons, that that neither that any institution is neither wholly repressive or wholly ideological. Right. That uh, that that they always have both of those components. The only question is which which one for this particular apparatus is is the dominant force. And actually, I. I think that more and more, even the repressive apparatuses function predominantly ideologically. Yeah. Or I also, th I think too, with a lot of them, like police comes to mind a lot, you have other parts of them that really take up the charge of being the ideological wing almost of them. Like uh, for police, you have the media whenever a uh, black person is killed by a cop, mm -hmm. no matter what the circumstances, the media is very quick to find some way that those people were somehow deserving of the fate that they obviously were not, or like police dramas or things like that that show an idealized police force that, you know, is always doing things right, is always correct. The, I feel like media does a lot, and I mean, that's yeah. not directly the police, the police one but uh, that plays into it i think a lot but i i feel like even even within the police itself just seeing a policeman somewhere is a kind of ideological function you know they don't need to be physically repressing someone just the presence or seeing a police or seeing a reminder that police are part of society i think plays an ideological function similar to to how the armed forces works there's there's a strong ideological function of of our state armed forces oh yeah yeah and, and celebration thereof and like the one event that we have in uh madison here where we live is the big firework festival every fourth of july which is just full of ideology right because it's the the celebration of our nation so it's got the patriotism but early in that event there are usually um some Air Force planes that fly overhead and impress everyone by flying fast and all of that. And, you know, that is, uh, that is primary, primarily an ideological function. They're not there to, you know, forcibly repress anyone. Uh, they're there to fulfill an ideological function. Yeah. And the people's reaction to, like, the ideological functions around the police, but I think even more so the military, if people aren't convinced that there's an ideological component there and stuff like that. Say something bad about the military or people in the military to almost anyone, right, left, or center, and you will not be received with a positive uh, view. Like, I mean, uh, it was the... For Vietnam, you know, people said that, you know, the soldiers returning were spit on and called baby killers and stuff like that. Well, that didn't actually happen. But go ahead and, and say that to somebody that uh, a soldier returning from Iraq is murdered babies and stuff like that. And you're, you know, you don't even have to be that extreme. But just say something bad about them and watch people's reaction to see, like, just how ingrained the that uh, that apparatus is in people's minds. Yeah. 
I don't support actually doing those things because you <laughs> you'll get beat up or shunned by your family or something. We don't want to get you in that much trouble. Yeah, or at least into an argument. And what, yeah. If yeah. If you have someone that you argue with anyway and you just want to make that person really mad, go ahead and do that. Yeah. <laughs> but well, and I think there's also uh things from a Marxist perspective to say about, you know, the the structure that the the folks that choose to go into the military are put under and and the promises made to those folks and and all of those things that in many ways the the reserve army of labor is is called upon to fulfill some of the most awful positions in society including you know doing doing the the dirty work of the capitalist class yeah yeah, we could do a whole episode just on the ideology that's ingrained upon people who join the military when they join it. Yeah. Yeah. Not that most jobs aren't doing the dirty work of the capitalist class, because it's very hard to su- survive in society without in some way participating in the capitalist society, which is is kind of part of the point, right? Is that it's so suffocating and so prominent that you cannot escape it. That's how a system thrives. Yeah. Aside from literally going and living in the middle of nowhere, you're forced to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Another comment I want to make about the term ideological state apparatus. Uh, Althusser mentions that maybe st- that the term is not appropriate because many of the ideological apparatuses are not performed by the state. I have to be honest, I did not find his argument as to why it is the right term very convincing. Yeah. He he essentially says that the distinction between public and private is a distinction only inherent to the capitalist system, and therefore anything that supports capitalism is part of the quote-unquote state. I feel like that is... Mm, a definition of the state that is maybe a little too divergent from from what I want to use as my definition. I, I just feel like most people are not thinking of that when they say state. E- even most Marxists, I think, yeah. have a definition of the state that involves at least government contractors. I mean, you have to be at least somewhat involved in the government. For So, for example, included in the ideological state apparatus are things like culture. So, a Hollywood movie, like the B-movie, or, or the magazine on the rack, or whatever, or the local TV news. These things are not things created by, controlled by the government or the state uh, most of the time. And so I think that I would just call them ideological apparatuses if yeah. if I were in Althusser's position. Yeah, I think part of that's too a product of the time because he was a member of the French Communist Party and I think he eventually ended up being expelled from the party too from based upon his works. But I think that that goes into just being a product of the time and of that where, you know, you still had the Soviet state where the state dominated and was everything. So that would be, that would be my best guess as to why he thought that that really worked. We've hit on before sort of one example from the scholastic apparatus, which is the bells in schools preparing work just to get people used to the bells. But even the idea of like teaching civics in school or social studies, like if you take um, economics in high school, which I did, you get only capitalist economics. Like you don't, you know, they, they, they fulfill to me ideology for capitalism and the way of what they don't teach you. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like if you read, probably one that a lot of people have read, Howard Zinn's of People's History of the United States. Like, that shows a lot of things, or lies my teacher told me. Like, mm-hmm. those show a lot of the things that they don't show you, and it's it's not like a malicious, you know, they don't necessarily sit down, although 
Texas, I guess, school board does, but they don't necessarily <laughs> sit down and go, these are the things that we're terrified to let our students know. But it's just, you know, common things that get taught and things that don't get taught. And, like, it's not, you know, they're not maliciously doing this. They're just picking and choosing what needs to get taught because you can't teach everything. And, mm -hmm. like, economics is a great example since I'm an econ major. Like, no, no Marxist stuff gets mentioned at all. It's yeah. capitalism is just, it's that's just it. Like, you don't, I took a class called Money and Banking. We didn't talk about money because, I don't know, like, do they not want to talk about the origins of money or that capitalism hasn't always existed or it's existed in different forms and what are different thoughts about money and things like that? It's just, it's just there. It's just something that's it's just there. Yeah. All yeah. of economics yeah. is about price, yeah. just figuring out prices and fluctuation and flow. It, there's no reflection upon the system yeah. itself. Start with the assumption of a developed economic system. Yep. That's step one. Yeah. And then step two, whatever the class is about, then, <laughs> then do that. Yeah. So. The, I, I, I think you're right to point out all of these different ways ideology functions just in education. And I think it's important that you, uh, a thing that you said where, um, I, I'll say it in a slightly different way that when we say education is ideological, we're not saying that the things taught in your social studies class are wrong. You know, many of those things are factually true. Maybe all of them. You know, every single thing could be factually true that you learn, but it doesn't mean that those things aren't being cherry picked in a certain way to present you with a certain national pride or to, you know, whitewash over, um, the, the, the more problematic parts of our history or to, you know, just, uh, ignore that there might be an alternate system. I, I did have a little bit of um, talk of Karl Marx in my econ class, but this was the point. They brought Marx up so that they could then refute, refute Marx. What we learned was not Marx. What we learned was why Marx is wrong. I think we had the same econ teacher in high school, and the only thing he said in my class that I can remember about... Uh, left-wing stuff was that communism is a system of distribution without a system of production. Which I don't think is right in any way, shape, or form, no matter what you do. But the point was, it was immediately brought up, simply explained as nonsensical, and brushed away. Yep. And I'm also going to say there's one thing that's factually wrong that you were told in high school, and that is the Civil War was not about states' rights. It was just simply about slavery. Yeah. Like, that, that one's not like a... Uh, no, that's just wrong wrong just false <laughs> yeah but but i guess my point is that it doesn't even if that even if that point was conceded and it could be i think capitalism could survive with oh, with yeah. acknowledging that you know the 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 ideology that we have doesn't have to lie to us ideology is not about lies it's not about you know uh nazis all marching in a row it's just anything to promote and support the current system. Yeah. It shapes the way you view the world around you in very subtle ways mm -hmm. without you realizing it. Yeah. And it's true of pop culture and high culture and everything in between. You know, I think that's another thing is uh, sometimes I think folks on the left are are quickly dismisses dismissive of pop culture. But I think the same problem is true of high culture. I mean, some of the art world stuff that Colby was talking about fits into that same framework. And I think it's okay if you don't like pop culture or if you don't like high culture and you do like pop culture. I mean, that's, that's one thing that I think Marxists need to come to terms with is the fact that a lot of the media out there is in fact awful and you can torture yourself by abstaining from any part of culture that promotes capitalism you can try to do that to never enjoy anything that promotes capitalism or blah 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 but it's kind of a losing battle 
Like you might as well just give in at some times and say, yeah, this film is really awful ideologically, but it's fun. So I'm just going to enjoy it. Doesn't matter how hard you try. Cause yeah, one, you can't escape it. And two, you know, there also can be joy in consuming culture and stuff like that. Like, I am really super stupid excited for Fallout 4 to come out, which is a big product of capitalism. And I can tell you right now that once I get that game, that is probably all I will be doing. <laughs> like, we will... It's going to come out near a weekend. We will not be recording this podcast on the weekend that comes out. I will guarantee it. All right. Because, yeah. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that because it's... You can't, I mean, I think you, you made this in the point, uh, in the episode where we're talking about you is like being a Marxist isn't like being a vegetarian. Yep. You can't pick and choose the non-capitalist things because it's all the capitalist things. Yep. Yep. Yeah. You, if, if you tried to live a lo- a life completely devoid of any capitalist influence, it will, one, it would be a losing battle. And two, that's not really the point of being a Marxist. The point is, to change society, not to abstain from it. Yeah. But I think being aware of what's going on is also good. And it's not that every single minute of playing Fallout or watching a movie or whatever that you're critically analyzing it from a Marxist point of view, but to be able at some times to do that is important. I mean, that's kind of the point of, of why we're Marxists is because we've looked at Marx's approach to understanding the world, to pulling back the ideology to see the essence or the core of what's going on, the, the truth beneath the appearance truth, and we found it compelling. You know, that's the reason why why we continue to be Marxists and, and do things like this podcast is because we found that useful. We've It's rung true for us. Yeah. Not only that, but for a lot of things, I find it hard not to do it. It's like the Matrix. Once you know what the Matrix is, you cannot unknow it. Like, once you start to understand Marx's analysis, it's really hard not to have things jump out at you that didn't seem so weird. Like, I've been noticing a lot lately, um, like, the bathrooms at the university I go to. Mm-hmm. Like, when you go to the bathroom, what's staring you in the face is just the brand name of the people who use make the toilet. Like, that's weird. And if you look, like, there's just brand names all over the place, like, just sitting here. Like, that's a really weird thing to have plastered in a thousand different places all over your house. Yeah. Like, there's possibly less brand names when you go into the store. Like, it's... No. Okay, that's not true, but you know what I mean. Like, it's yeah, cause startling. Any, almost anything you buy has the brand name on it. So every commodity is, in fact, an advertisement for that commodity. Yeah, and that's one... How did advertising get to that point where it's okay to start putting advertising everywhere? I mean... Look at your phone. If you're depending on how you're listening to this, you might have had to listen to an ad. You know, That's like true. it's it's weird. It's very weird and unsettling. Yeah, advertising I think is one of the most pure forms of capitalist ideology because its whole point is to convince you to buy something that you would not have otherwise bought. It's it's a piece of capitalist ideology that is there to promote the system beyond the point where people have fulfilled their needs. You know, you can almost make an argument for capitalism when people are fulfilling needs that they really have. Yeah. But then beyond that point, it becomes this weird thing where you're now defending a system that goes out, spends money to create a need, and then sells you something to meet that need they created. Yeah, you know, to tell tells you that there's something wrong with you that you didn't know was wrong with you, and then says, "But don't worry because we can sell you something that will make you all right again." Yeah, and 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 does that. See all uh, all medicine ads. Yeah, medicine's a great one for that. 
cars you know it's like the you know the if you look at advertising especially today you know and it's been this way for decades when advertising first came out it was about telling you about the product well if you really want to sell something people don't necessarily need another thing what they what you need to convince them of is that there's something inherently wrong with them and that it it needs to be an intangible thing because an intangible thing can never be fully complete so you can convince someone that they aren't masculine enough. And if they buy this fast car or uh, this powerful gun or whatever it is, that then they will be masculine. Oh, once again, they will be fully complete. That's a really good advertisement. Or you're not athletic enough. You know, wouldn't you want to be more athletic? And it, only if you bought these shoes, then you would fully be the kind of person that you want to be. Yeah, or the one that they love to play on because it plays on our most basic biological needs, sex appeal. Hmm. You will be able to breed with the most amount of people with this product. Yep. Because couldn't we all just be more attractive? I think an interesting product, though, that you'd never see advertisement for that's wildly popular, which you could almost argue maybe is actually fell in need is sriracha. Oh. Because the... I'm not going to be able to say it, The Hong Fong sriracha the, uh -huh. with the green top. Yep. They've never paid a penny in advertising. Ever. Hmm. And it is wildly popular. Yeah. Maybe it's because they don't advertise. But right. It's a, maybe it's a niche market in anti-advertising. Yeah. And it very well could be. But, I mean, that's... Literally the only product I can think of or even know of that does not advertise. Hmm. Although once people start saying things like that, it basically is advertising. Yeah. <laughs> I've just advertised it. But you, let's see, yeah. I like you spicy food. <laughs> Another couple of examples of ideology I think would be fun to bring up would also be sports. Oh, yeah. Uh, and th I think this is an interesting topic to talk about on, you know, from the left wing perspective, because a lot of lefties aren't interested in sports at all. I know that you follow soccer. Yep. Uh, and I am not particularly into sport, at least not, um, not like as a viewer. I like to run like jogging and disc golf I like. So I kind of like playing sports, certain sports. But I, the, but that isn't really like what people mean when they say, do you like sports? You yeah, know? they mean, if somebody's asking you in this country, do you watch American football? Yeah, I mean, especially in Wisconsin, that's, I mean, a big part of it. Uh, but there's a really, if you want to hear some really interesting dissection of how sports are ideological. The guy to look up is David Zirin, Z-I-R-I-N, who is a leftist who loves sports, but understands how they function ideologically and, and will dissect it for you and in really interesting ways. Even Honestly, as someone who doesn't follow sports, he's very interesting to listen to. Is he in Democracy Now? Is Sometimes. Okay, he's yeah. not like an anchor, but they will have him on as a guest. A little husky, brown hair, white guy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I know who that is. Yeah, he's quite good. I'd, I'd recommend looking up. Uh, he's got a couple of lectures or talks that he's given that are very entertaining. And, and will just lay out for you the history and ideological background of all sorts of different sports, especially from the American, the U.S. perspective, that is. Here's one we can hit on that we've hit on a few other times, is the family as a repressive apparatus. And it seems a little weird, um, and maybe even especially, too, if you're younger, that seems even more bizarre. Because we sort of touched on, I think, before, how the family structure is shifting mm -hmm. from... That, But if you look at, you know, the traditional 1950s idealized American family, 
it's the father's in charge, and then the wife is subordinate to him, and the children are subordinate to both of them. Mm -hmm. And just the structure of that, where you have one person in charge, usually a male, and then everybody else just sort of does what they need to to fulfill their needs, like that is reinforced, well, actually, feudalism. It's reinforcing feudalism, but that works for capitalism, too. Yeah, yeah. It sets up a, a, at least a hierarchical structure, which, you know, is is an interesting thing. There are, there are many ways in which the family structure can support and reinforce the structure of the overall society. I think an interesting part of this as well is in many of the same ways the family functions a lot like schooling does in that sense, where the structure mimics the structure of the overall society and does it in a way to prepare the student or the young person to be part of that larger society, which I think is a very interesting thing because to not prepare the person to be part of the larger society can be a problem in certain ways. You know, if you cannot function as part of the society that you live in, then, you know, you already mentioned in this very episode that jail or prison is the place where people uh, who cannot function in the given society usually end up. A high proportion of those people come from not whole families as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the family is an essential part to set you up to be a participant of society. And in a certain way, it's almost not a bad thing. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's bad to live in jail. You don't want to be in jail for the most part, usually. Yeah. If you're going to send someone into war, you probably want to show them how to use a gun. Yeah. Like, there are certain ideological functions that, you know, are, uh, that, I guess it, it's similar to this, to when we were talking about unemployment, I think we may have said it this way, the only thing worse than being exploited by a capitalist is not being exploited by a capitalist. In other words, being unemployed. So the, the only thing worse than being ideologically indoctrinated to be a part of a capitalist society is failing to get that preparation and floundering in a capitalist society because a capitalist society has no time for you has no value for uh, from you you know if they can't use you to their needs they will do away with you you know either by locking you up or or you know some places we do have the death penalty yeah one um one thing with the family that i know i struggle with trying to figure out how to deal with is chores because I don't know about you, but when I was little, you did a certain amount of chores and then you were paid an allowance for that, which is basically training people to just be wage workers. Hmm. So I have a lot of struggle with how do I post my child, your children, sorry, Henry, um, <laughs> that, you know, you need to do work to help because, you know, we work as a unit and thus it is good and right to help us. But reward them in a way that they, you know, like, how do you, especially when all their friends are getting an allowance and stuff, like, how do you, how do you deal with that? Not to mention it's expensive. I don't know. I have thoughts on it, but you have to understand that I, <laughs> I'm not a parent, so who knows if this is worth any value or, or not. Um, but I have thoughts on it because I've looked into a lot of, like, how do rewards function in an educational setting? And there, the person who's done a lot of research on this, the theorist that I like the most is Alfie Cohn, who I've mentioned before, who he wrote The Case Against Competition, uh, which is a wonderful book about how competition actually is extremely inefficient in many ways. But he's also done research into how does rewarding someone for performing a task function, uh, you know, how, how effective is that? And what it's really good at doing is getting per that person to do that task when they know they will then get a reward for it. So if you want to convince someone to be a good person, to do something because it is the right thing to do, 
it the worst thing you can do is to reward them by paying them or otherwise for that thing. Right. Because what they learn is to only do that thing if they are then paid for it. You know, sort of like work. You know, I wouldn't do a job that I don't like just because it needs to be done. That's not how our system works. You do a job because you'll be paid for it. And and it doesn't make any sense to do it when you're not being paid for it. Well, when you want someone to do something because it's the right thing to do, you don't want to set up that kind of framework for the person. Convincing them to do it because it's the right thing to do, well, that's the hard part. But there's a bunch of science to show that it's not effective to reward the person, especially on like a piecemeal basis. You know, like, yeah. like school programs caught being good are, they've done some studies to find like, if you reward a kid for like holding the door open for another kid, what it causes them to do, the end result of that is kids will look around to see if someone is watching before they hold the door open for someone else. Yeah, I believe that. And that's, yeah, we don't do the monitor reward stuff. We, I don't know, my son's going to turn four in a few weeks, so... You know, he's not that old, so we don't have to have it figured out yet. But any time I'm tempted to be like, tell you what, how would you like this? My wife, who's ever turning into the more radical, always likes to point out that we don't want to reduce our family relation to a mere monetary relation. Uh -huh. And I'm like, "Good, yes, comrade wife, you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the the takeaway when it comes to ideology is is not that ideology is wrong in the sense of factually incorrect. And it's not something that, you're, that you have to abstain from as a Marxist. But it's something to be aware of. It's something to kind of study and understand. And, I mean, especially, I don't know, I've always been interested by that approach but I, mean, I I do have a bachelor's degree in English, so I'm probably predisposed to the idea of analysis in the sense of looking at a piece of piece of culture and saying what what is this really saying to us? But that's that's a part that's something that's always been part of the tradition of Marxism and something that's always appealed to me. This has been a good introduction to what ideology is from a Marxist perspective. So now we've basically got the vocab term down. Like you understand where we're coming from when we talk about ideology. And hopefully this will help make sense of future episodes where we dive into particular uses of ideology and analyses of it. It's been about one week since we recorded the ideology episode, but I wanted to to say a little bit more on the topic, the thing that I think is really important about ideology and to understand about it is the way it functions as a part of social reproduction. Social reproduction is the acknowledgement that every society needs in some way to reproduce the conditions of its own existence. So this happens in physical material terms by raising the next generation and training them to have the skills to to work for the capitalist class. It happens in machinery by either maintaining it or by producing the machines that will replace the old ones. It happens in raw materials by either, uh, you know, in doing something to ensure that new raw materials will be available by the discovery or by, you know, planting trees or whatever. But it also happens not just physically, but also in the world of ideology. Ideology is there to reproduce the conditions of capitalism, to allow capitalism to continue to grow, often without any challenges, and also what causes people to submit to the rule of capitalism. So the ideology, understanding it from a Marxist perspective is not just important so that, you know, you can do critique of culture and understand the, the effects of culture, but also to understand ideology 
as a piece in a larger puzzle of reinforcing and reinstating capitalism on a daily basis so that it can continue to be the dominant system of our world. Marxism Today is created by Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt and is a project of the Democratic Socialists of America, Madison, Wisconsin chapter. We are not official spokespeople of the DSA and the views expressed in this podcast are our own. You can find us on Twitter at Red Wagner 2, that's the number 2, and Schmidt AJ, that's S-C-H-M-I-T-T-A-J. Our episodes are all available for download on our blog, marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com. You can share your thoughts about this episode and others on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash marxismtoday. Also, you can find information about the Democratic Socialists of America Madison chapter on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash DSA Madison. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.